you want, I can just introduce myself. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let 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 okay. me let me let me shout and shout sure. in in your yeah, hearing. Right. So so here we are, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the new the next speaker. And Dave, uh, is, well, Dave is an IT services executive, uh, cl uh, client partner and associate VP for HCL America. Previously, thirty years with IBM, and Dave has been doing some great work with automation of uh, some of the. Uh, uh, YSTOR markers that we use for certain research. So uh, previously we were saying how can we make this easier for the general public to actually understand the data and manipulate the data. Dave is working hard to actually do this and uh, uh, he's going to talk to you about the new SAP program that he has developed. So please give a warm welcome for Dave Vance. Good afternoon everybody. Everybody hear me okay? The good news, and probably the most important thing you need to know about me, is if we need to turn this off, I can usually shout loud enough to fill up the minute. So if you're new to, that's fine. Um, thank you all. What uh, Morris didn't have time to say was uh, I've been a genealogist for over 30 years. Um, I've been in genetic genealogy since the first National Genographic Test back in 2005. Um, and uh, so a lot of this I kind of arrived at a lot longer than I should have, but uh, it took me a little while um, longer, so a lot of people who have come out this a lot faster than I have. We're back to YDNA here on the subject. I'll be talking about, um, but I'll, I am not going to spend any time talking about uh, the, the biological side of SNPs and SDRs mostly because we don't have time here, but also because you've heard about it through other speakers, um, and also because my program and my interest is more on the genealogy side anyway. So I'm talking about how to really merge these two fields into producing useful information for genealogy. We tend to spend a lot of time talking about genetics, and it's all very interesting. Uh, I do understand that it's still very interesting, but I'll see if I can turn this up a bit. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to speak up, because I don't see if I'm in control. Anyway, um, uh, I do understand for the folks who are fairly new at this, I do understand where you're coming from. My wife, I've been talking to her about genetic genealogy for a long time. She still hasn't quite grasped it. Um, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, this little graphic I made, which looks like it's a window on the path of DNA going to an illuminated path that's very grand. Actually, I made it for my wife because she's always said when I talk to her about genealogy that she wants a good throw or something. So it, it can mean different things for different people. So anyway, when we're talking about why DNA testing, uh, is that okay? Are you going to start? Okay, because otherwise I'm, I'm just going to turn this off and I can talk. But, all right. Um, when we're talking about why DNA, we're talking about doing analysis on a group of this is almost by definition, you can't do y SNP analysis, YDNA analysis by example. What we're talking about is producing a tree that looks something like this. The MRCA is the most recent common ancestor, if you don't know the terminology, and there's a number of kits. So um, we have a number of kits underneath it. It doesn't matter if you have three or 600. It still goes back to some most recent common ancestor. That could be 45,000 years ago. But YDNA is all connected at some level. So any project administrator, surname administrator, anyone who's got a group that you just screen scraped off your project and are trying to figure out yourself is usually looking at some group of people trying to analyze their DNA. Now, how do most people make sense of their Y-DNA? So here's an actual picture of someone trying to make sense of their Y-DNA. Typically, we have a number of resources that we call on. There's all the terminology and concepts, conversions, parallel mutations, couple groups, infinite alleles, markers, SDRs, and SNPs for other things, and all sorts of things you can go Alright. 
then we've got all of the reference sites. You've got family tree DNA, you've got full genomes, you've got ISOG, you've got y y browse, y and you know, soon we'll have y else, y mountain, and y bother. But there's all sorts of places to go to for help on these. Then you've got all the y step reference trees. You've got Alex Williamson's great site, you've got the LZP site, you've got the DNA site, you've got all kinds of sites there. Then you have all the data that you have at your disposal. So this is my little data symbol. You've got all the various YSTR marker data. You've got 25, test, 37, 67, 111. Also, don't forget we have 500 STRs that life pulls out of two files that are just waiting to be analyzed that you can't do much with. Then you've got all the SNPs. You've got you know, if it's full genomes, big Y, and all the CARP SNPs, you can run off, so the panels, you've got all those databases. But you also have the paper trails. You also have the genealogies that your group has done that you know where your mail lines fit together at some point. So you've got all that data, and what I'm really trying to talk about today is how do you put it all together? Just look at the STRs or the SNPs or even the genealogies, but put it all together. Now, normally, if you put it all together, you can change that look, which generally changes to that. Because it's not easy to figure all this out. Once you put it all together, you can stare at it for hours. And if any of you have project administrators who support your either surname group or Haplogroup group project or whatever, thank them repeatedly. Because the work they do is usually a lot more than even, I mean, the, I'm, the, I'm also an administrator for the Vance Surname Project, and there's people who do a lot more work than I do on this stuff. So, Please believe me that they work hard. Um, so let's talk about so let's talk about all the user data and how we use it. This is an entirely subjective chart. And for most of you who are project administrators, you will vary with me on the dates here, but you'll also have some version of this chart. So we've got present day on the going back in time. What it's trying to show is the effectiveness of the various sources of data. So for instance, for the SNP data, it's very useful back, you know, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. As you start getting closer to present day, currently, the effectiveness goes down. Why? For two reasons. One, the, the coverage of the Y chromosome isn't enough yet to give us SNPs for more than about every three or four generations. And the second reason is we don't have enough uh, next generation sequencing testing coverage yet to be able to get private lines fleshed out and get the branching for every single uh, uh, branch that we want to build that tree from the most recent dominant system down. So uh, the effectiveness of these for building the tree actually goes really down somewhat. The STRs, on the other hand, they sort of fill in the genealogical period, maybe go a little bit further back. Again, people differ on how far back they're useful. I say it's usually 1,500 to 2,000 years, but the noisier ones, the most frequently mutated ones, don't go back that far. Um, but typically, you can make sense of them back to the Babylon farm. But after that, convergence and just general noise tends to cloud the picture. And more recently, they're not quite as useful because you can't count on the actual mutations happening at the rate at which they're predicted to, because a slower moving marker can mutate just as as, as um, 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 recently as a faster moving one, and you don't always know which one happened when. So there's a there's a bubble of uh, effectiveness for STRs. I'm still of the opinion that they are useful. I'll talk about that in this presentation. But I absolutely understand that the SNPs produce good branching, whereas STRs are probabilistic. You have to go into them with an idea that you find the likely branching, but you don't always know for sure which one it was. We'll talk about that in the um, And of course, genealogy data, which is usually very good in the most recent generations, but it drops off quickly. My favorite story I had uh, a person connected to my ancestors a few years 
years back on Ancestry. And I was originally very excited because their tree went back a lot farther than I did. Um, but I kind of lost interest when I found that their earliest ancestor was recorded as, uh, he, he was put down as Thor from Asgard. <laughs> now, I should say, if you're in the audience, I'm not discounting the possibility. Um, I do have an uncle who's pretty good with a hammer, but <laughs> I'd really like to have some snips or a haplotype for Thor, uh, you know, maybe go back to Odin. We, you know, we certainly know Loki wasn't in PC, but anyway. Um, so, the effectiveness of that data drops off quickly, so its reliance isn't that good. So what you really want to do here is kind of ride this top wave and use as much good data as you can to get the best possible tree. Now, as I'm going through here, remember, we do not have enough data today, even out of all three of these sources, to produce a perfectly accurate tree. We can only do the best we can with the data we have and the data will be spotty depending on who has done the research or who has done testing. So when we put all this together to create a tree, you've got a standard ancestor tree where you start all the way back here with an ancestor that has a son who ends up having sons who end up branching down to present day. So you get this structure. Of course, a lot of these have died off, so you end up having a structure that you can test for that looks like this. It's usually what I call long stalks and bushy tips, because you have these long stalks, if you plot it against a time scale, you have these long stalks going back in time, and then you get a lot more of the bushiness at, in the more recent generations as you have more surviving lines. If you turn it upside down, it kind of looks like Queen Anne's lace. So um, that's kind of the typical structure of the YDA chart if you call it as a concept. Um, in trying to recreate this tree with the sources of data, you start with the steps. So you start with steps that fill down from the prehistoric uh, branches. Some people on their lines are lucky enough that they can get pretty close to present day just with snips. Uh, often your uh, public SNPs, or even the surname SNPs, will stop at about, you know, maybe 1500 AD if you're lucky and you can get that close. But for a lot of us, we only can go back to maybe 2,000 years ago and get that far with SNPs. So it will vary depending on the lines, how much next generation sequencing testing has been, has been done, how big your group is, that you're analyzing. So you get down as far as you can with SNPs. Then you have the genealogies that fill in from the back and then they go back in time. Clearly, you may not get as far back on all branches. If you're lucky enough to have a royal line, you can go back. Um, uh, you can go back to the 12 or 1300s. Uh, otherwise, here in Ireland, I know um, we can get back to the 1800s or so if we're lucky. I, sh I should say Vance, my own line, is, uh, on, is a line from Ulster Scott, uh, Im immigrants from Ulster. Um, uh, I've been able to go back on mine to the Inishalm Peninsula in Donegal. Uh, to, um, my, my ancestor there was born in 1753, so I was able to cross the Pong, which is lucky. But, um, but in general, we can only go back that far, and I would never think I would get another generation or two back. It's not likely, because at that point, most of the records will always come out, depending on where you are. Um, so the SDRs will fill in the middle. And again, three sources of data, put them together to make your best tree. Now, the challenge then is to take all that data and create the tree. How do we do this? First question is, why do we need a tool? We have tools available today. For those of you who have been around for a while, you know the tool called Fluxus. Uh, a lot of people have used it. I know in the, in the videos which we have online from Morris that he's done, he uses Fluxus to show the uh, the basis for this, uh, however, it is only SDRs, there's no connection to SNPs or genealogies, and it's not that easy to generate or analyze. You really have to be an expert in Fluxus to use it. Um, it produces output that, uh, to steal a line from Mars, that tells me I'm descended from the constellation Ursa Major, but not my uh, And uh, it, it is not that easy to analyze. So, anyway. There, is that better? Okay. Um, for some reason, I'm 
this is a. I I I actually stole this uh, straight from Morris. This is one of his mutation history trees. Again, I can't um, um, recommend his videos enough. They're a great way to produce these trees. They are manual, and not everyone has the time and inclination. And it's not that easy to model scenarios. So if you're trying to get a scenario that you know. Uh, is more likely than another, you pretty much not have to start from scratch, but you have to back up and do the you know, analysis all over again and start growing trees again, which is not a good thing. Uh, so, the trick was to automate this into something that was readable, useful for analysis, and concentrated really on the genealogy side of the equation as opposed to all the genetics. This is the kind of output that SAP produces. You get all the tips, in in uh, yellow. So these are all um, um, these are all the endpoints of the tree. It goes back to a group MRCA. Always goes back to a common ancestor. You get the branching nodes in blue that are the uh, common ancestors for the smaller subgroups within that overall group. Uh, they're marked with SNPs for genealogies where appropriate. So that's the common ancestor and the ancestor. You also have the STR mutation history in black above each point. Now you don't always know when exactly they mutated, but you know that it happened a long time from the time of So the tool basically builds that picture for you, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to go through uh, a very briefly how it works with a couple of simple examples, and then we'll talk about some of the analysis around that. Um, that's the tool itself, that's where it is. Uh, anybody can get my name off of the uh, schedule and send me an email, and I'd be happy to answer that if you, if you need it, but that's where it is. Um, you basically build an input text file, and you hit the button to execute, and it runs. Um, the input text file is the most important thing. So, if we create one, we will start with just four kits. Uh, there's uh, two of 37 markers and two of 67. It doesn't matter how many markers you put in, it'll accept any number. Um, if I put them in the text file, the text file simply is divided by sections. So the SDR, the only required section is the SDR section, and I'll talk about why. Um, but you put a slash SDR data, there's a help file online that explains all these sections for you, so you don't have to remember the, the, the format. Then you just put the kits in with the kit name and all the numbers. Um, again, there, it's, it is fairly accepting on the formats. You'll see a lot of the detail in there. Um, if I run this just by itself, I get that output. Now, obviously, I tailored this example for this group. But you get four kits, one, two, three, four. It has decided that the common ancestor branched off with a three SDR signature here because these two share that in common. Then they each had their own mutations and ended up with kits two and four as their own branch. Then you get this one here has its own uh, it um, has its own signature and then has other mutations down. Now. When we talk about STR mutation history trees, we talk a lot about conversions and parallel mutations. And here the tool has decided that there's been a parallel mutation because it had to create one to explain the mutation history. So, uh, marker 456 has gone from 18 to 19 here, and here both. What it does is it picks the most likely path, so it bases it off of the STR mutation rates and assumes that the most likely ones to mutate are the faster um, are the, the faster markers. So 456 is a relatively fast marker. It's certainly more likely that it mutated than these three um, in a parallel. And 443 is a slower time, I'm sorry, 442 is a slower one. And that one is not as likely to have mutated twice. So that's how it builds the tree. Again, it may not be the perfect tree, but it's the most likely. Now, it also produces some other tables as output. It produces, it will repeat your input so that you can verify it with all of your, all of your kits. It produces the table of genetic distances that it calculates. And it also produces an adjusted genetic distance table, which, it, which has the uh, parallel um, 
mutations taken into account. So that just bumped the mutation that the nerve distance between kits two and three just bumped up by two because of that parallel mutation. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those details, but just so you know what the output looks like. Now let's try, oh, first let's answer the question, why does it require STR data? For two reasons, mainly today. First, because STRs are as common as opinions. Everybody has them, some people have more than others, and every time you turn around, somebody wants to share theirs with you. Um, that's because of um, the family tree DNA product choices, for one thing, but as, as long as we still have uh, people taking STR markers as their entry point into genetic genealogy for Y testing, we'll have a lot of STR markers around for analysis. The second reason is because, as, as I said before, we're still better at figuring out the branching within a genealogical time frame than SNPs. That will change as whole genome testing becomes more popular and more uh, affordable, and uh, as we figure out the branching, but it will take, my guess, seven to ten years before we can exclusively rely on SNPs. And in that time, STRs, we already have 500, we'll have more of those to be able to test. So, I, you know, my opinion, not shared by everybody in the community, is that STRs will still be useful for quite a long time. Uh, so now let's add some, uh, some SNP data and some genealogy data. Uh, you just put two other sections in. You give it the, the, uh, the, um, the actual test results for the SNPs. Now understand that the only SNPs that are useful to put in are the ones that divide the group. If you put in a SNP test that's common to all, it will say it's common to all, but that doesn't give you much branching information. So you want to really break it down into the SNPs that are, for instance, it says this person is positive for Z2356, and that's actually negative. Uh, the other two are actually negative for that. This one here doesn't know, uh, because they haven't tested those, so there's no. It assumes if you don't put a SNP in, that it's unknown. I've also put in that Don Smith is the ancestor of both kids two and three. Now, for genealogy, it assumes that if you don't put it in, it's negative. So what I'm telling you is also that kids one and four are not descended from John Smith. If I run that, that changes the picture significantly because before it thought one and three were descended, were, were more closely descended, and two and four were. I've now forced it to consider that three and two are the descendants of John Smith, so it John Smith there. It has now decided that the only way that can happen is that three STR signature has to be a parallel mutation here. So it puts it, it's not going to judge my genealogy. If I told it that, it will accept it. And it will put that branch on there and tell me how that looks. Now, once you analyze it, you look at that and say, that's probably not right. But it takes that extra step to be able to look at it. The tool can't do that analysis for you. If you put that genealogy in, um, so, suppose I did that, I said, well, that's not right. So I go back to check with kids one and four, and, um, oh, sorry, the output here that, that produces an additional table that just gives you that, that step in genealogy data. The blue is positive, the red is negative, the gray is unknown. So suppose I, I go back to my sources, and kids four and one say, well, we might be descended from John Smith. We really don't know. We haven't been able to go back that far. So I said, okay, I'll put that into my genealogy instead. I can do that with question marks as opposed to positives. So if you look at the output table, it will then show those in gray saying that they're not sure if they're it. And I think I'm going to get this. And when I run the table again, it says, okay, I'm back to where I was before because now I can make sense out of the STR mutation and I can build the tree back the way it was before, and John Smith is up here in the box as the common ancestor for everything. So it has decided, even though I said I didn't know if one and four were the common were a descendant of John Smith, it's decided it probably is because of the way the SDRs play out. The last thing is, if you take a look at this step that I said only kit one was positive for, Z23516, it's decided that that has to be a private SNP for kit one because I told it that kit three was negative. If kit three is negative, by definition, it has to be at this level that that SNP occurred, if this tree is correct. Suppose I go back and I say I don't know for sure if 
if that fit is positive or not, either the test was, was uh, bad, and had a couple of reads, or it turns out you didn't test it, thought you had whatever. Um, I, I go back and now I say, I don't know if a person is positive or not. What the tool will do, since it doesn't have any data to go on, to tell it if that SNP is probably at, at, at one place or another, is it, it will put it in both places with brackets and say that's the range at which that SNP could have occurred. So I know it can only be as high as this because these two are actually negative. So it can't have happened up here. But it could have happened either here or here because I don't know at this point where the SNP has actually mutated. So it tries its best to put all this data in the tree, produce a tree that makes sense, but it's not always a perfect solution. You do have to. This is still more of an art than a science. That's why you have to play with it and see how it works. So, a few details. Okay, so that's the, the um, that's it, showing the range where it actually could have happened. Uh, there are a lot more options. For those of you who want to play with the details, you can, uh, I'm going back to, I think, what James Irvine said during the panel, you want a tool that can give you finer motor control over these trees. If you want to change the SDR weighting to somebody else's, you don't like uh, the ones that it uses, you can put your own in uh, if you want to. Uh, you can always ignore certain uh, SDRs if you think your CDY is causing noise you don't like how it comes out of your tree, you can tell it to ignore it. Uh, you can calibrate the TMRCAs, I'll show you the TMRCAs in, in, in a minute. Um, you can show more information, you can show information in the tree, all this is explained on, on the site, so I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time. And then there's a lot of adjustments that you can make just for color, you can you know, change all the colors, you can add labels to the trees, you can annotate it with your favorite things, those aren't used. In building the tree, they're just things that you can use them to show the people that you're communicating with where um, certain things are, what groups belong in which areas, and that sort of thing. Um, so the TMRCA calculations. Um, anybody who's talked about time, the most recent common ancestor, when they, with anybody knows that this is a complicated subject, it is very general. We cannot localize these SDRs and SNP mutations down to exact uh, years yet, but there are statistical models that can generate estimates. This one uses one from Ted Mordred. Uh, it was popularized by Mark Ghost and a few other people. Uh, if you've seen any of the literature, uh, it calculates these for every node on the tree as well as the, um, as the group uh, ancestor. It's got the error range, so this is a 1650 AD estimate for error range of 1500, 1800, it gives the number of generations as well. Uh, with an estimate for how far that went back in time as far as years. Uh, the accuracy of the error range depend on how good your STR data is, how many markers you have. By the way, I should say, it is STR generated, not SNP generated. Um, there are two competing ways to do it, but the only way to do SNP TMR scans for every node is to have next generation sequencing across your entire group. And we don't have that that sort of coverage today, so that's why the tool still relies on this TR generated team which it is. Um, it can be calibrated, this is a fairly recent feature, but if you know the ancestor lived in, let's say, 1700, you can put that into the tool and it will adjust this and the upstream and downstream ones to compensate. So it'll tell you, okay, you know when that ancestor lived, I can, I can make some better assessments in this tool as to when the other nodes probably occurred. Um, and I'll always say this uh, caveat, use them sparingly and use them really as general estimates. Are we still within the time of surnames? Is this, how far back is this really? Uh, is this one 1600 and the next note is 300 BC, meaning there's a long time span between these and so on. That's about as useful. These cannot be used as estimates of when the ancestor was actually born because we just don't have that much data on, on this at this point. I won't talk about this much. This is just for project admins and folks who want to play with the recognition. Uh, it will not recognize um, uh, the very frequently mutating ones like CDYAB and 712 and 710. It doesn't recognize those single uh, mutations as signatures in the higher parts of the tree. 
that, that can also be adjusted. Um, there is, so a lot of this depends on the STR uh, haplotype of the group MRCA. It backtracks to calculate for a mutation history tree. It backtracks to figure out what that haplotype probably was when it produces the whole Y mutation tree. Um, that means that what that haplotype was is very important to how the tree is built. Um, it, 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 so it's producing this chart going back to that group from a recent common ancestor. If you put in another haplotype, right, the motive, and I know Morris and I have talked about this too, so if you put in a motive, it will assume that that is the haplotype for this group, MRCA, and it will try to, to compress all of the all of the mutations that probably happen to be here into this angle. Which means there's a lot more mutations that it has to deal with, which means the tree will probably have branching that, whether correct or not, will at least be on, be on signatures that don't make sense or may even be wrong branching. Uh, we've had occasions of that, and the real correction is to make the haplotype that this starts with be as close as possible to the ancestral haplotype that that group ancestor had. Um, usually the best estimate of that is just the modal of the group, which is what the tool calculates on its own. But that's not always true if, if your tree is not balanced well. Sometimes you have a group that is tested a lot underneath it and that will overweight the modal haplotype. For any of the project administrators out there, you know what I'm talking about in terms of getting the tree to, uh, the mutation history tree to look right. You have to make some assumptions about what that group was. Um, and the tool will allow you to override the internal calculation, which you have to do experiment. Um, if you try to run, the tool doesn't care how many people you put into it. Uh, you can put 547 people, which if you know Robert Casey, this is his actual tree. That is the tree that he produces. Um, it is the height of, if you printed it out, it's the height of a small child and it'll run halfway across the soccer field. Um, I, that's a difficult one to analyze, um, but usually the picture is not that useful. So the tool has an option. You can print out the entire tree as a text file with all the same information just indented for your various notes. If you're a visual person like me, that's harder to look at, but I'm not going to analyze 547 people through a picture either. So um, it's, a, it's a judgment call. If you have two or three hundred people, um, you can decide if you like the output in text format or in picture format, but either way, uh, it's a lot of people to have this. I'll quickly run through, if you are a project admin, but you do have a larger group to analyze how you would go about it with this tool, just in closing. Um, so, this is an example, and you won't see the detail, but it's not important. That's an example from the Vance Surname Project. Um, Placed. And a lot of us have done this by hand before, so we already know the 
the major subgroups for a surname project or something, right? But we always have outliers. There's always people that don't quite fit into any bucket. Depending on what they've tested, you may know or not know where they fit, but generally you have some that you don't. So I run the whole tool just to see if I can find a year that sticks. Um, where, where all of those people sit. Then I break it up into the various groups, and I do a tree on each of them, and I do a tree on each and every one of those. Um, then I add a lot more shit data and genealogy data. Um, and I just analyze those. I'm not going to. I will not go through this entire uh, thing, but the steps that you take on it, the steps you take are to first go through and find any inconsistencies that you know are wrong, so the, so the tree may so the tool made decisions based on the incorrect data, or it made the wrong decision, which is possible. Um, and then you try different scenarios. You can try all of these in order to try and get to a better degree. This is, as I said before, an art scale, not necessarily a science, but at least you've got the, the effort of building a tree already done for and you can start to analyze it and make decisions based on how it's set it up first. And you can all those. And then, you can be creative with the input. You can, for instance, for instance, decide that there must have been a slip that marks a certain group because there's a clear pattern of SDRs. So you can, without knowing what that slip is, because it hasn't been discovered yet, you can make an assumption that there's a slip there and see how the tree looks if you put that data into the tree. Now, as I'll say on a chart coming up, um, just make sure that every assumption you make is documented because you have to prove all those. So for instance, I have in in um, one of the Vance projects, I have a pair or a pair that there's a signature that defines these branches, but they both include the marker 460. And it's gone from 11 to 12 in both places. that's mutated in both places and the tool has, because it's a pretty fast moving marker, the tool doesn't really have enough information to know if it happened once or twice. So I couldn't leave it that way and just say we don't have enough information to know if those four share a common ancestor before the overall movement marker. Or I can put into the tool that I know they share an ancestor and see how it looks. So now I put in what I call possible ancestor one and the tool says okay, Tell me there's an ancestor that all of you. It's now created that as a single mutation and it produces the same tree underneath. So I've made an assumption about an ancestor. Is it right? I don't know. But if I make the assumption, I now have to prove it. So it gives me something to go do. Um, once you have your best tree, you can, you can put in finishing touches. A lot of us in the surname projects have burning questions that our members would like to know the answer to. Are they related to a particularly famous ancestor? Um, when did their immigrant ancestor come over? When did they split off? There's a lot of questions that you can, if not answer completely, at least give them data that helps explain that. Um, one of the problems with the advanced learning project that I have is that a lot of the members tested a long time ago and then it sat for a long time and they didn't really see a lot of value out of their original test. So any information I can give them at least about the possibilities helps. And then what I look for is to get feedback from them. Okay, what testing, you know, is there any genealogy information I don't have yet that would be useful? Uh, would you be open to more testing? Um, that's a particularly interesting subject because what we want to do with our members as well is advise them on what further testing would be useful. This is unfortunately a game where every test opens up new questions and the possibilities for more testing. Um, so you never are done with the answers. Um, the way that the tree can suggest additional testing, uh, if you have thinner, um, 
the tool does produce in the lines that it connects, it does give you an indication of how sure it is of those connections. Um, because the thinner lines are less certain, the thicker lines are more. It's a little, it's a little esoteric, but it's the easiest way to show confidence levels in terms of how the kids connect. Because um, no kid gets left out or behind. It's not found in DNA where there's a where there's a, a particular cutoff to determine how related they are. If you put a kid into the data, it will put it on a tree somewhere. Even if you only have 12 markers and no SDR or genealogy data, it will find some place to put it on the tree. Obviously, the confidence in that kind of information is much lower than if you have 111 markers with initial SDR information. So there is a confidence factor in terms of how far the tree that every kid will end up on for some um, if you have SMP range, if, if you have STEM ranges, the plus or minus that will tell you where under there you should test to be able to show where that SNP occurred. So you can start to allocate your private SNPs perhaps to particular areas of the tree or suggest where people should test more. They can even do, I use it to suggest how I part SNP testing for my members when they don't want to spend another $300 or $500 for the next test that would be good for them. They just want to spend maybe $17.50 um, uh, at um, YC to test that particular SNP to find out if they're on that branch or not. So that's useful uh, to be able to help people spend the money a little more wisely. Um, which branches have recognizable SDR signatures? Again, I suggested SDR you know, panels of the sort, but there are you know, two or three SDR markers that are very clear signatures for particular subgroups, for people who know that they're in that general area or think they're descended from an ancestor, it gives them a pretty easy way to give them a yes or no. And then, of course, if it's a yes, then they want to test a little more to be able to find out where or how far back they connect or that sort of thing that they're more testing. But at least they haven't spent the money without getting um, at the initial yes or no answer out of it. If there's no branch, so if you have uh, a particular node with a dozen different people under it, and there's no clear branching. That gives you an area where you could uh, advise people to either do some next generation sequencing, or a SNP panel, maybe if that's useful for your group, or something that gives you a lot more knowledge quickly in that area because you need to find the branching of that group. And then what other uh, testing is necessary to develop the, the best tree? So if you spend some time on the tree, as opposed to building the tree on the analysis, it can really help you give advice to your um, The tree does have internal SNP trees, so if you tell it that you're positive for a particular SNP, it will automatically know that, it, that, that that means that it's negative for other SNPs on other branches. So if I say I'm, I'm, I'm acting positive for this SNP, it knows that I'm negative for all of these other SNPs, and that I'm positive for the upstream SNPs. Now, obviously, that's only the public trees. I've sourced it off of Alex Williamson's tree because it's the most up to date from a citizen scientist standpoint. Um, and it does have everybody from U106. That's the entire U106 tree. That's obviously not readable, but it will produce it. Uh, you can print off these SNP trees, by the way, for any major SNP. You can go in and just plug it in. There's a SNP tree function that you can get this tree output for any of the SNPs that you are interested in. Uh, if it knows about them, it has U106, L2, and L21. So at least that's the uh, major R1B um, um, uh, tree there. Um, and uh, I have run it on the 500 SDRs that Weifel pulls out of the MAM files, which I think is kind of the next generation of these tools. Um, it's interesting data. There's two major problems with this. First of all, we don't have good SDR um, mutation rates for all these steps yet to be able to produce reliable branching. So it determines signatures, but they're really not based on weighting, so it's hard to know if they're right or not. And the other uh, problem is it's 500 STRs to analyze and find signatures for to figure out what to do with. That is still a lot of manual effort to analyze. It's not easy to do. But I actually had to move the output over to be able to fit all of the mutations onto the tree. It will produce the same tree for 500 STRs. Um, so, hang on a second. I think um, I think that's it for me. I'm going to leave you with an image uh, of what I think the future looks like.
Uh, first of all, um, I think we need, as I, and I've heard some of this, I've been sitting here all morning and all day, and I've been hearing some people say the same sorts of things, which was gratifying, but I kept wanting to jump up and go, yeah, 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 that's right. Um, but I think we need to connect more databases together. Clearly, we need more testing, but also we need more connectivity. We need to be able to port things over back and forth. I'm proposing we need some kind of a crowdsourced facility where admins and people who are responsible for a group can build their trees and share with each other for commentary or various kinds of analysis. Um, again, Alex Williamson's is probably the closest to that we have today. It's SNP only, although he does produce a lot of SDR information. Um, and that's, that's about as much as we've got. I think we need more, and of course, for me, because I'm a visual guy and I want the modeling and the, and the capabilities to look at the data, pull out useful analysis data, but be able to see the tree and how it connects. Um, and on that vein, I will leave you with one picture of where I think we sit today. This is not my invention, but I agree with it. I think this is us. Um, I think we've survived the initial tsunami, but we have a lot more with uh, the continuing uh, affordability of next generation sequencing, the coverage on the Y, the amount of STR data that we can get out of these that will continue to grow, as well as, let's not forget, the continuing digitization of internet records that gives us more genealogy stuff to pull on. Um, I think we have a vast amount of data, and I, I know uh, I'm just echoing what a couple of other uh, presenters have said today, but again, to echo them as well, if we don't get in front of this with better analysis tools, we will just be sitting you know, drenched in data without the ability to do anything with it. So, um, that's all I've got, thank you. I'm going to carry this around because I don't trust the other uh, uh, live streamer. Um, I, I worked very closely with Dave on, on uh, aspects of the tool and we're very closely involved in discussing, hey, I've tried it on my piece of group, uh, what do you think of this result? What's happening here? So there's a lot of tweaking going on. What version of the tool are we going to now? We're on version 2.7, I think, now. We just added uh, the colors and the calibration for the MRCAs. Um, I'd love to add, it, it does not have a lot of SNP of the uh, phylogen block data yet, but that's because it's not particularly useful in, in producing the branching. Um, but I'd love to add that for people to be able to, as, as it does branch, as you do find ways to break up those blocks, it, it, it could automatically recognize that and build it better. I'd love to have it retain more information. At the moment, it's just a SNP tree and your input data. So, you know, start to get to these kind of tools we're talking about, but I think we need a quantum leap as opposed to the evolutionary leap. Questions today? We have one here from John Drew. Dave, thanks very much. Um, Sam, this year, I think it's fantastic. Um, I was wondering, um, what kind of bit Yeah. So his question was, the input files were a little bit fiddly, and how do you... Actually, the input files were a little bit fiddly, how do we uh, remove them? Thank you. Um, yes, the format is in sections, and you put the data in various sections, but of course it's dependent on the input you provide. It does parse the data pretty well in terms of recognizing how to do it, you know, the parentheses are optional and all that kind of thing, but to your point, um, the the input file that you build then has to live on and you adjust it over time, right? And this is something that you're basically producing another version of your data just for the tool. I would love to input directly from an Excel file or do something else, but again, the formatting has to be right. So the other option I have is to go directly to the sources and try to read data directly from either BAM files or other sources. Then putting genealogies in becomes difficult. So to your question, I don't have a perfect solution yet. This is a temporary one, I think, and as the data gets more advanced, the text file will not be a permanent solution. It's all right if you're just trying to analyze a group now, but it won't survive for very long. It's a good point. We have a question here from Pete Show. Don't this way here. It's great to see that you can handle the 500 SDRs in one book. How do you handle the problem of your controls? That's a good question. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the question was how do you handle no calls? Um, the tool, if you notice, doesn't really know SNPs as biological items. You put SNPs in as positive or negative, and it's kind of uh, these kits are in that set or they're not in that set. Or something like that, right? um, so no calls, you simply would either put it as a question mark as an unknown, or you just leave them out entirely. And it will make a decision trying to figure out whether it's in that set or not just based on the STRs or, or the genealogies if you put some in. Um, so to answer your question, it kind of treats it as not input, but it will show you on the tree whether it thinks it's part of that or not. Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question. Right. It doesn't ignore them, but it doesn't count on them either. If you, now, that may be something that you want to try as a scenario. You say, okay, I'm going to check if this is positive how the truth looks, or if it's negative how the truth looks, and which one looks better to me. That might give you an, uh, an, an indication of these without the certainty of whether or not they were positive. Um, one last question, actually. To what extent do you think it's possible that Family Tree DNA will integrate the SAP program into what they offer their customers? Um, I've not talked to them at all about that, and I think they would go for something themselves, to be honest, no, just knowing. Um, I would hope that, I mean, as much as I like the tool because I created it to simplify my own life, um, I'm hoping somebody comes out with a next generation tool that leapfrogs over this and does something much better. So I would hope not that I'd mind talking to them, but I think rather than integrating my work, they should do their own and build something hopefully much, much better that allows them to draw directly from their database and produce output that looks something like this or gives us as much information um, with more analysis, more uh, probability behind it, more certainties or estimates thereof, etc. It gives them, I mean, they've got a lot more people that I think can work on that than I do, so. Mm -hmm. Excellent, but we have to close the day here, unfortunately, because uh, we could talk about this for quite a while longer, uh, because I think Dave Stu is probably one of the most you know the things that come out in my DNA research for a long, long time. And I just want to congratulate you and thank you for all the support that you've been giving me and the rest of the community with the wonderful SAP program. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Lance.